Podcast friends, what is going on? Jonathan here, host of the Venue RX, and I am so excited to be joined today by Irene Tyndale. Irene, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Jonathan. Well, I can't wait to get started talking specifically about planners and mm-hmm. venues. And we're going to be getting into all sorts of stuff, though. I can tell already before the show started, we were just just on a roll. And I had to tell you, whoa, you know, slow down. We got to save this for the podcast. So I'm really, <laughs> really pumped for this. And I know everyone Me too. is going to love it. So where, where are you from? Um, okay. So originally, I was born and raised in New York and okay. uh, grew up in Florida, in Orlando, Florida. So went to high school and college and got married in Orlando. And about 14 years ago, we moved to Atlanta, Georgia. And this is where I started my company eight years ago. Awesome. Awesome. So what sparked you to start a wedding planning company? Like that's, I, I'm always fascinated the journey that pros get through <laughs> to get, get to there and, and that industry. So what was your journey like? Yeah, it always um, amazes me too. I love it because I think sometimes um, for those who are new in the industry, we look up to people and you're like, well, they're there. But it's like the story about how did they get here, right? Like, how did we get here? So I personally started my journey in the event planning industry. So I've been planning weddings and events for some capa- in some capacity since college. Wow. And so, you know, I'm the eldest. I'm the nosy rosy. I'm the busybody. I've <laughs> always been really involved in, you know, in high school and, you know, I got to college and I wanted to, you know, that college experience that you see on TV, like, how can I get involved? And I just dove in head first. Um, And I always joke and say that I was event planning before it became a thing, before Google and U2 University. Like we just kind of did what we did on campus. And um, I started doing that and I never thought about it. You know, I went to the University of Central Florida and we have one of the best hospitality schools in the United States, the Rosen School of Hospitality. And I didn't major in hospitality. I majored in communications or comm. <laughs> and it makes no sense now in hindsight, but they also didn't have an event planning program back in the 90s and early 2000s. Now they do, and it's an amazing program, and I'm jealous of all my alumni and students there. But, um, you know, when I was 21, 22, one of my dear friends went um, to go visit her boyfriend who was in the military and came back married. So she eloped and I looked at her and I said, I never have known someone to elope, right, Jonathan? It was like, only people do that on TV. We're good little Catholic schoolgirls. Like who does that? Like who <laughs> runs off and gets married without their family? And her and the mom, like her mom and her mother-in-law was like, you have to have um, a wedding. And so we had, so they kind of took over and she begged me to help. And I was like, I don't know nothing about weddings. I've been to weddings. She's like, it's just, it's just another event. It's another party with a girl in a dress. Like it was just, I'm like, okay, well, she's like, if you don't help, I, I think I'm going to wind up on the six o'clock news. So help me. <laughs> I was like, okay. So I'm here for it. <laughs> yeah. I'm here for it. And this is before Yahoo and all that stuff, like search engines were like a thing. Like, I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to go by what I kind of know and work with the mom and the lady at the country club and it was mostly kind of keeping her on track and, and being the buffer <laughs> between mom and the moms and her. And it, that started and I did it a few more times for friends. And of course I planned my own wedding and then still doing, you know, nonprofit work and just all these things. And all the while for free, wow. because I had no, I just thought it was something I was good at doing. I loved doing it. I didn't know what it was. It wasn't a title to it. I was just helping and fast forward, did it for a few friends of ours um, and then wind up doing more nonprofit. Um, after college, I got a job as a corporate planner. So corporate planning by day, social event planning by night. Like it was just like, and I always joke and I tell, you know, new planners coming into the industry who don't have children, who, who don't, you know, are not married or newly married. I'm like, you know, will you do this for free? And they look at me I'm like, no, will you do this for free? And are you willing to put in the, the work? to learn. And they're like, Oh, I'm like, cause that's what we did. That's what I did for years. I worked 40, 50, 60 hours a week and loved it. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, fast forward a few years later, um, I got an opportunity to get a job here in Atlanta at a small boutique hotel. And it was amazing. Cause I was the sales manager that handled weddings and all social events. Okay. And because of my wedding, I didn't know, I've never sold anything a day in my life. <laughs> and I was like, but they're like, but the hotel was known for their service and how they took care of their clients. And so they're like, oh, you're a wedding planner. We'll teach you how to sell. 
And so that started my hotel career. And I loved it because as a corporate planner, I was the planner and I was always trying to get the best deals. And my market was Atlanta, New York, and Phoenix. So when I told my Atlanta hotel contacts that I was moving to Atlanta, they said, you're going to be on our side now. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody was like, well, why do you want to go from being the planner to being the, on the hotel side? I'm like, I know how to plan an event with my eyes closed. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to learn the back of the house. I wanted to learn what makes a chef tick. I wanted to learn how to build a banquet event order. What what goes into that? Like I felt like that would help me better understand it. So once I learned that coupled with my planning stuff, it was great. I loved it. So I worked for three different hotels in Atlanta, all boutique size. I loved it. I had great connection with all my vendors and creative partners in the area. And then the last hotel I was at eight years ago had different um, vision for the position. And it said, time for you to go. Or like my husband loves to say, <laughs> God released you because it, yeah. he's, a, it wasn't, I was never the girl that wanted to, I never had entrepreneur in my, like I was going to be a business owner. I wanted to be a chicken charge in the corner office. That was my whole thing. Like I want to be a CEO. I want to run something. Right. Yeah. I always had that passion and it was his idea. You know, after I had my moment and it was a couple of weeks before Thanksgiving and he was like, start your own business. And I literally laughed at him, Jonathan. And I just got a awarded planner of the year last year, uh, the planner of the year this year, a couple of weeks ago. And I said that in my speech, like this was not in the plans. And eight years later, here I am. I and love so that. It was just like, it was just a kind of transition and it was a natural transition because now it was like, I could really service the people that I wanted to service and service people the way I like to service them without having somebody above me saying, no, you cannot spend that extra hour with that bride because you have another bride that you have to see or, you know, somebody dictating my schedule. And so here I am eight years later. I love that. Irene, thank you for, thank you for taking us through your journey like that. But, but thank you for mentioning that you wouldn't necessarily have ever considered yourself being an entrepreneur, because I think that concept is scary to people like, oh my gosh, what go out. And like, I don't see myself doing that, but you, just like you mentioned, you didn't necessarily see yourself starting your own business, but you did, you just received an incredible award. You have been recognized by your peers, which I think is, you know, the way that really, you know, where, when you've kind of, um, I don't want to say made it, but you know, really like, <laughs> right. you feel good. You feel good. Yeah. Because people are recognizing you for the work that you've done. And, um, and so for any new planners out there, or even people who maybe were in your shoes, you know, doing hotel sales or working in a certain department like that, you may have this inside of you and you don't even know it. You don't, because you're taking all those, you know, and I tell this to my coaching clients, I'm like, don't, don't, don't discount your job. So like, if you're doing a side, for my people out there who are doing a side hustle, like their passion is your side hustle, like your, you know, photography, videography, planners, you know, cake bakers, whatever, and you have a full-time job, look at them as your investors, number one. So you don't have to worry about who's paying your bills and how to pay your bills as you're building your business, right? Unlike few of us who just got thrust into being entrepreneurs and then you have to figure things out as you go. Give yourself that time and credit, but also you, you're going to take a bunch of nuggets and a bunch of um, lessons from your current job and all the jobs you had before you. Like we, there's a group of us here that have all had corporate jobs, you know, other planner, uh, planners and industry people. And we have these conversations like, having a corporate job or having that corporate background early on in our careers has taught us to be, how to service our clients better, how to have the drive to become better CEOs and all that stuff. Cause there's things that you learn. You learn the good, the bad, and the ugly from every boss you've ever had. Mm-hmm. Like you have some bosses, you're like, I am never going to be like that person. <laughs> and then you have people be like, oh my gosh, I remember he or she took the time to teach me this, or they gave me multiple chances when I should have been fired five times ago, right? Like you learn those things, but like, don't ever discount those beginnings or like what you've learned from that job. So quickly on that, if someone's listening to this right now, and maybe they are in a corporate position at a hotel or a anything, even a planning, maybe they're planning for someone else. And they have this idea that they want to go start their, their own thing and their, their side hustle. What advice would you give them to kind of get the most out of the current position that they have to set them up for success later? You know, how I think I've looked at it is 
like I said a few, a few seconds ago, like looking at the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because we, okay. we've all had it. We're like, when I, you know, it's like when I grow up, I'm not gonna do that to my kids, <laughs> right? Like totally. you think like when your parents get ready to do something for you, you're like, to, when someone your parents say something to you, like I'm never doing that, and then you become a parent, you're like, I see why they did that, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know. But yep. it's the same thing in your in your current position. Like, how would you do things better if you were in that position, or having your own company? Or, and what would you take with you that's a good thing? I had a director who, you know, I'm a doer. Like I love servicing our clients. I, I joke with my team and I was like, if I could find somebody to run the company for me, I would be a happy clam because I'm best in the field. I'm best doing site visits and working with the clients and work. I love logistics and working on timelines and diagrams all day long and connecting vendors to clients. And that's why I love that. Right. And, and connecting my clients to people that they need and my coaching clients and everything, but the company is my company. Mm -hmm. So I have to be in it. So the past eight years, I've been on a personal journey to be, yes, a better CEO, you know, which didn't start to year three when I really realized, Oh, I have a business. Wait, <laughs> Like I was just servicing people. So just kind of like while you're sitting there working, you know, don't do it on the clock. Let's not rob Peter to pay Paul. Like, <laughs> like be mindful, right? But like on your breaks and in your evenings, on your weekends, like start, I think we forget to, to dream sometimes, Jonathan. I feel, and, I, and I've had this conversation recently with one of my friends and I've had it with my husband. Like you get to a certain age, you, you're adulting. Like we're oh. out here adulting, like you get married, that's the first major adulting thing you do, right? Not even graduating college and getting your first job. Like, I feel like you buy a house or you get married, you're like, ooh, I'm really adulting. I got to mow the lawn on Saturday. I'm really adulting. <laughs> or, or I'm at Home Depot, <laughs> Memorial Day weekend instead of at the lake. Yeah, I'm adulting. <laughs> that's for sure. That If you're at Home Depot on Memorial, yeah, for looking for a sale. Then <laughs> Labor Day it's weekend, <laughs> like, and, and it's packed. Have you ever been to Home Depot on Labor Day weekend or Memorial Day weekend? or, you know, any of those 4th of July weekend either. Like the place is packed because you you have an extended day. But kind of like think about what it is that you want. Who do you want to service? You know, how do you want your company to operate? You start writing those things down and start dreaming. And then, then get yourself some, you know, find a coach, find a mentor, you know, start networking, find somebody in your, in your area, vendors in your area that you um, trust. Specifically the whole line. I really want to do this. I really want to do this. Or I'm thinking about doing this. What, what do you think? Now we'll say this, be prepared for people to, that you're going to have two kinds of people when you say, Hey, I'm really thinking about leaving my hotel job and starting my, whatever company it is. You're going to have some people that are like, yes, you're going to be great at it. Oh my gosh. What do you need? Who do I connect you? Are you ready to go? Do you want some of, you know, do you want to do some side work? And then you have some people that are like, Oh, I, I don't think that's a good idea. It's, it's just what it is. I just had somebody tell me that story the other day. She was working actually um, in, in another state in California and she kind of mentioned it to another planner that she was thinking about eventually. She's like, oh yeah, that's not going to work. So she was looking, she was working at a current job and discussing her passion to like, okay. And the person was huh. like, and I was like, oh, I said the best way to, to, to say, the best way to thank her is to be successful. Yeah. That's it. And I was like, and that, that's it. And, and you know, it's sad because she was like, I was like, you weren't going to take her business because now you don't even live in the same state. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, so you don't know where your future is you know, going to take you. So just be prepared to, to you know, prepare yourself. Start making your, start making your list of things that you want to do, things that you need to do. Um, get yourself some extra education if you need it, those kind of things. You mentioned just I think being present and actually experiencing everything that the job has to offer, mm -hmm. right? And you were talking about look at the look at the things you like and the things you don't like and all of that because later on you may run a business or own a business. Right. And I think that touches on two super important topics. One being that I think many people when they get a job, it's just kind of like ah, I'm just going to be here and just show mm -hmm. up and you know uh, do my job and go home and forget about it. What you're talking about is really being intentional and kind of like noticing. Well, this right. is how they do that. And maybe asking some questions and like digging a little bit, because then if you ever do run your own business, you're aware of some things. Irene, I want to uh, go back though to something you said about, you know, you said three years into your business, you realized like, I really have a business. <laughs> yes. I think this is something that wedding pros struggle with. I think that, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm including myself in this, like, I know, you know, you, like, I love 
talking with the people who hired us, the clients, right? right? Our guests. Like I love that connection point and serving those people in a very real way, right? Mm -hmm. But that is not the hierarchy of the business and payroll and banking and corporate structure and all this other stuff. And so I think as creatives, as people who that really, you don't get into this industry unless you love. Absolutely. Some people, component of what it. we do, you have to, yes. Totally. So if, if there is a business owner out there that's maybe struggling to scale, because mm -hmm. they are very good, like you said, you want to be in the field, you want to be doing timelines, you want to be doing this different stuff. Do you have some advice for them about how they can kind of make that transition to do both? Because those are it's a different job knowing about payroll versus, you know, talking with your clients and knowing really what they're looking for. Listen, I thought I, I thought I wanted employees and then the whole employee, we went down that rabbit hole one time with my bookkeeper. I'm like, oh, everyone's back to independent contractor. I just, <laughs> I don't have the mental capacity for that. Like it was just too much and a bunch of other legal stuff. You're just like, this is too much. But I mean, me, you know, we started in, we started in the first year I was in business. I, I had like three to four weddings and then it was like, maybe, maybe five weddings. And then it doubled to 10 and then it doubled to like 20. And then into year three, it was 30. And it was because I had a partnership with the venue. Right. Mm. And that it made it increase. And I woke up one day and realized that it was only by the grace of God that I still had a husband yeah. and children and family members that loved me because I was at every one of those weddings. Yeah. But then I also, you know, I, I also made friends with you know, I have a really great friend who's my business strategist. And now she's a friend. She was when she went from a vendor to a, my business strategist and a great friend. And she helped me map out all my procedures because everything was in my head. So I, I, I needed to, I added um, an intern who became an apprentice, who became an assistant, who then became a lead planner. And she, she did all that by just following me. And she learned by following me. But when I promoted her to lead planner, bless her heart, Shelby was like, I love you. And I, you know, I, you're a great teacher, but everything that's in your head has to be in a manual. Mm. I need you to write this down because you have a specific way that you do weddings. You have a specific, like you, and a lot of that stuff, yeah, we had some templates and some things, but a lot of that stuff is in, the, in my head because I've been doing it for so long. She's like, so you need it. So it, so my, my team forced me to do that, mm -hmm. which took me a little bit and they laughed and it was like little by little, as they needed stuff, things got created because busy servicing clients. And then I got with my, you know, my business strategist, Marguerite, and she was like, okay, let's sit down. And, and at the time I had two businesses. Mm -hmm. So I was, I had a bridal show that I was producing a boutique bridal show plus the planning company. So, you know, I had to sit down. So my thing is, is like, I joke and say, you know, I can plan an event, eyes closed, you know, eyes blindfolded, gag, hand tied behind my back. But being a, a, a business owner, my major was in business. It was um, communications, being a business owner, it was a journey that I had to say, okay, if I want this to, if I want to one scale and continue maybe adding team members and outsourcing things that I hate doing, like social media and, yeah, <laughs> and admin work and things yeah. that I, you know, sending out proposals, doing the busy seasons and, you know, monitoring and taking care of our website and our branding on and on and on. I need to figure this whole CEO business out. Like you really have a business little girl like you have a business it's not you're not playing you have a business um and you know and and so i made it a bit my my mission to get coaching you know join mastermind groups go to conferences you know and it was i inundated myself i jumped into it and i feel like as a ceo you were always going on a journey because you always have to check yourself because the reality is we're creatives mm -hmm. and majority of us creatives have our head in the cloud <laughs> we just totally. do we like we we didn't go into business we service our clients well and we love what we do so it was kind of like oh you are a business owner what are you going to do now and so kind of working on those things and the beginning I, I hit the ground running early on on my own and then after a year I'm like okay I'm just spinning my wheels and like I said earlier all information is not wisdom it's something I was talking to Jonathan about all information is not wisdom and I know that for a fact I have money I have invested money and got no return on my investment but guess what i learned a lesson mm -hmm. <laughs> like totally. i didn't get the you know like the lesson was my return on investment and so um i realized slowly but surely to kind of build my own internal counsel of i have mentors 
business coaches, business strategists, a brand manager. And it sounds crazy because, it, you know, when I tell people, they kind of roll their eyes. I'm like, listen, I'm not sitting on a bankroll of money mm-hmm. and everyone's not working at the same time. But there's times of the year that I check in with them. They all know each other. They know all of each other and they all are in my corner to help me get to the next level. Mm-hmm. And with every level, either their services increase or I find somebody else. Totally. I love that you're not afraid of failure though. You're going out there and you're looking for these folks. And even if like, if one person's not giving you the right advice and you're like, up, oh, like that was a lesson, I'm going to move on and I'm going to figure out the direction that I need to go. Mm-hmm. But I think the, the, the cost of not moving and the cost of not kind of figuring out what the next step is it far outweighs making a minor little mistake or maybe hiring the wrong person that need to pivot right. instead right. of just not hiring anyone at all. And nobody's watching. I think what I think, you know, I grew, I'm, I'm Latin. I grew up in New York and grew, you know, we joke about it now, but growing up, my grandmother would always say, well, what are the neighbors going to say? What are the people going to, I said, what are people? First of all, we live in New York city. No one cares what the next person is doing. <laughs> No one cares. Everyone's doing their own thing, heads down to the ground and going. So growing up, I used to have like, what are the neighbors going to say? And it's like, sometimes there's some quiet failures that you will have that no one needs, don't, you don't need to testify off the mountaintop. You learn from that lesson and you move on, but you take that lesson and what you've went through and you make, and you pass it on because the mess that you go through is not only for you, it's to help someone else. So I tell my, my coaching clients, Like I'm hard on you about your investments because in the beginning, I didn't have anybody coaching me through my investments. I was just like, well, you know, Susie Q over here, my friend Susie Q tried this and it worked for her and she told me about it and I'm going to try it. It didn't work for me. That that was a failure. I lost that 500 bucks, a hundred bucks, whatever it is, thousands Mm -hmm. and you move on from there. Um, You know, so don't be afraid. And I think we're all afraid to, to fail. Totally. In general, but everybody who's ever been successful, everybody has had multiple failures. Mm-hmm. I think also a lot of times as business owners, like you were alluding to, we're our own worst enemy. Yes. We don't want to dump all the stuff out of our brain. It's kind of scary to like take on these new different roles as a business mm-hmm. owner and not just as the operator. You know, we say we want maybe more freedom of our schedule or mm. to add revenue, but the steps to do that are very revealing in some cases. Like like you said, your, your team member comes along and is like, you should not be doing this. Like you are, you know, we got to get you doing something else. Like you posting on social media is not where you need to be doing, like hire that out, you know, but sometimes it takes those outside people speaking Mm -hmm. into our lives to help us with that. Um, Absolutely. And, and, And remembering your why, like, why did you go into business? Like a lot of people, you know, and I think about like, so what made you go from to invest in certain things? I'm like, because I realized after working for myself three years, I really liked it. And I have, my kids are now 12 and 10. And so when I started this business eight years ago, they were itty bitties. Like my, I, I have pictures of my daughter going to, um, to pick out linen with me because, you know, I had a bride who was in med school and she only had one day a week off. I'm like, well, that's the day the baby girl's home with me. And she's like, I don't care, bring her with me. And my vendor gave her, apples. she still remembers that Miss, Miss Harris gave me apples and she gave me this and I got to look at it. Like it just, you know what I'm saying? And now those are in the early days. Yeah. And you just have to re- remember like, why are you doing is why did you went, why did you go into business? And that's what keeps me more like, I don't, you know, I joke as like, unless I don't have nothing on the books for the following year or for months now, I still don't know if I can go back to working for someone else after eight years of entrepreneurship. It's kind of hard to do that. Totally not. Well, cause you've developed a skill set. You're looking for certain things. You're like, mm-hmm. you're, you're really experienced in not just doing one thing, but your experience in doing a bunch of different things and managing your time and managing a team. And Mm -hmm. so there are very few roles outside of, you know, entrepreneurship, uh, that really satisfy that. Right. (laughs) Right. I mean, let's pivot and let's talk about venues. Obviously Mm -hmm. we're the venue RX here. Um, and you know, we do have a lot of different topics for all sorts of different vendors, but I'm excited to hear from you. I think for someone who's running a new venue, and I've heard there's so many new venues that are coming on the market. There's obviously right. a lot of kind of weird buildup or inventory because of COVID. It's really changed it's, things. Yeah, it's 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 eerie almost. It's like you 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 see people closing their doors and either selling it. It's just like an it's a really weird 
It's super Twilight dynamic. Zone. Yeah. It is. It's really cool, but it's like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And the weird thing also for me is, uh, and I, I want to ask you about smaller weddings, these mm-hmm. intimate, these micro weddings, because I know you have a whole brand on that, but mm-hmm. I'm curious because I feel like with a wedding, mm-hmm. it's something that's in the future, right? Oh, it's yeah. something that's 12, you know, nine to 18 months in the future, let's just say. Right. And so if you close up shop as a venue, that's, that has a, a huge ripple effect, not just through your vendors and your brides, but like through all the other vendors, yeah. because they're either picking up the pieces of that or, oh, absolutely, <laughs> you know, so talk to me a little bit about venues and what you see happening in the industry right now with, um, with, with what things are happening, especially now we're like starting to open back up. So it's, I think it's even crazier in some ways. And it's, it's, we're in Georgia. I'm in Georgia. Right. Mm-hmm. And everyone jokes and says, you all haven't really closed. <laughs> so, and I said, well, parts of the city closed certain, you know, for a little bit. Cause I always joke as say auntie Keisha, our mayor of Atlanta was like, no ma'am, no sir. You cannot have 50 people. So we moved to the outskirts and I stayed quite busy in 2020 mm-hmm. outside of the, the city of Atlanta with, you know, in the, in the North Georgia mountains or in the suburbs, we stayed quite a busy. And even with all that, because things were going smaller and people were still having, you know, people were still having weddings that might've been just smaller. Totally. We are seeing an influx, not an influx, but a good amount of, we hear it in the grapevine of venues closing. Mm-hmm. Not as, Thank God, not as crazy as some other states. Because I know uh, Florida had a one particular company they were just closing and just like disappear. But what I've noticed is that when it does happen, it kind of like the planner, if, if that bride and groom actually have a planner, that couple has a planner, that planner has to get into like, I have to go find something for you mode. Totally. <laughs> like, and, you know, some people have the availability, some venues do. What I've noticed that the ones that have the availability from the venues that are closing are the ones that are newer. Right. So I know quite a few venues here in Atlanta that opened at the top of 2020. And so they did some work last year, but they have a lot of availability still because they are new. So it's like 2021 hit and they were like restarting again. So, you know, it's, it's helping us to, I've also seen the human, the human side of things where we're all jumping in to help these couples do whatever they have to do for all our couples that had to pivot shift do whatever they had to do last year we didn't charge anybody a dime over what they were what their contract says wow. we whether you were wedding management client month of wedding management client or full service client everybody got treated the same mm-hmm. and the reason i did that was one i wasn't working every weekend so a phone call and an email didn't cost me any more time than if i was working every weekend totally and i'm also you know i also i'm a huge believer jonathan is how you treat people now will you will benefit later and i you know you treat people well and you take care of them they remember that you know my angelo said they will forget how you treated them but they won't make forget how you made them feel so and true. there were so many crazy stories last year i was blessed with some great amazing clients and vendor partners that we work together but yeah there is a transitioning of then you have a lot of people who are taking advantage and not in a bad way, but taking up or taking up the opportunity of like, Oh, this one's closing. I'm going to buy it mm-hmm. with no event, event industry background, Totally, <laughs> like, which is crazy because it, it's a good thing, but it's a bad thing. Cause I've, I've one of the arms of our business of my business is venue consulting. Mm-hmm. Cause I do have the hotel and catering background and I have the planning background and you know, the connecting vendors and all that good stuff. I have that background. So I've been hired to consult venues and to help them put their packages together and train their sales team. And I've worked with people that literally like, I just had a building and I've had it in the family for years. Let's convert it into a venue. And after work with them for a few years, they're striving and doing really well because they listened. And then you have people who are like, I, I don't know anything about it. And I'm just going to let you have the place and run it down. <laughs> Cause we've had <laughs> venues like that. It's like, this would be amazing. If you put some rules into place. Oh no, no, no. We want to be friendly and open to everybody. You, yeah, you can, you still need some rules. Like, you know, totally. that kind of thing, you know, you so, just can't do whatever you want to do. <laughs> so as a new venue owner, then coming into the space, let's say there's li- someone listening right now who maybe just bought a venue and they are, they're, <laughs> they're, Maybe they're new to the industry. Maybe this is a retirement plan for them. Maybe right. um, they're transitioning and they 
you know, has some money saved and, you know, they put a down payment on a space and it's kind of this, like they're looking to maybe get out of the city and buy a property and they're going to live on the property and host weddings or events on it. I would right? never do that. Love, bless you all who do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there are plenty of people, you know, and yes. owner, owner operators who do this. Um, yeah. But what are some steps that they can take to run a more professional, streamlined operation? Because that's really where, you know, you have you have to meet a good vendor team. But how do you do that? What maybe should be their first point of contact along that journey? Well, number one, if you're able to find somebody to consult you, um, to help you like a venue consultant, I personally think the best person to consult you is somebody that actually lives in your city and mm -hmm. who knows your market. There are some things that are universal that if somebody venue consults, you know, internationally or nationally is the same and that's great. But as far as getting to know your market, so like if you, you know, you can hire somebody to help you put, get your SOPs together, get your sales packets together. There's certain things that you have somebody who's not local, but to find someone in your local market to, or even to bring them into your local market to get, who knows your clientele, who knows all the people in the area, that's number one. Like that's great. But I also would connect with your local wedding publications your local wedding publication, your local event associations, whether it's WIPA, uh, you know, Aaliyah, NACE, uh, ABC, the list goes on. It's a whole alphabet city, right? <laughs> like there's so many names, but to kind of connect with them and see who's out there. But the reason I say your wedding publications is because a huge part of my success in the beginning was because of Modern Luxury Atlanta and mm. my connections with um, the salesperson, like my account manager there. And uh, she's amazing. And it's like letting her know, hey, this is what I'm doing or this is what I'm working on. This is what I'm looking for. And as she's out connecting with her clients, she can make those connections. But if you're looking at building a really great um, vendor team, creative team to be a part of your list, I would start with them because they know everyone, mm. right? Or do your simple research as Google people in your area look at, excuse me, the knot and all the different public, uh, different directories out there and see who you see more frequently, search Instagram and see mm -hmm. what you see. And you want to be able to find pros that fit your ideal client pros that fit your aesthetics of your venue or your, you know, what you stand for and who you are and the kind of service that you're putting out there. You, you mm -hmm. have to find that because that's going to help because reality is they're going to help sell you and you're going to help sell them. Totally. And it sounds like, it sounds like maybe a good person to start with is a planner mm -hmm. because yeah. the planner, a planner could come, you know, like yourself, like if I'm in the Georgia market, I want to hire you, Irene, because you're going to know, you're going to understand Atlanta. You're going to understand the type of client, what the, what that client's looking for. If they're coming in right. from out of town, what they're looking to experience, maybe even some design things that are, yeah. that are hot or trending. And then the whole experience thing of like, right. you know, and it really sounds like that's something that you take into consideration with what you just said in the quote with Maya Angelou, understanding what is the feeling that these clients are getting from you as you're starting to relate from them. And that absolutely. does relate to the vendor team. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And as the venue, I mean, it's with anything, but as the venue, if you have a preferred list or in the conversation of when you're doing the sales, the on-site visit, right? Or even on the phone, but the on-site visit and you're walking through the site and you're kind of mapping out the day for them. I like how, you know, when I was a sales manager and even when I do uh, venue sales for some of my clients is, you know, you create the couple at the door. Hi, Susie and Johnny. My make-believe couple is always Susie and Johnny, right? It's like, Susie and Johnny, how are you? You know, do you need to use a restroom, whatever, whatever, give them the tour, but walk it like, oh, this is where you're getting ready. This is the ceremony, like make them feel like they're, they, they can see themselves there, right? That's how you walk through that. But as you're walking through the space, try not to make it robotic because this is, this is personal money. It's not like corporate, like as a corporate planner, some people like, I don't like corporate planning. I'm like, I love it, John. Then they call and they're like, I have a hundred thousand dollars, hundred people in Chicago for me, click. And that's it. <laughs> Yeah. It's like, you know, it's like, here are your four or five. This is what I'm Can looking for. Can you do for. it? This Can is how much time. This? Yep. Very That's all I need. Yep. You know, we're, you know, uh, I had a discovery call this morning and instead of it being 20 minutes, it was an hour because she was referred to by one of my current brides 
And then we just, we clicked culturally, we clicked. And it was just like, oh, 45 minutes later, like she's like, oh my gosh, the baby's up from a nap. And <laughs> like, oh, it's okay. Because we, it was a conversation. It wasn't like so robotic. Like mm -hmm. I have a list that I do that. So get to know the couple as you're walking through the space. Oh, have you chosen photography? Oh, what are you thinking for design and style? Oh, have you found a wedding dress? Oh, let me see your ring. It's getting to know them as people and who they are at the core because it's a personal decision. And venues have such an important role because sometimes they hire me after they have the venue. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes I'm hired to help them find the venue. You know, like, so yeah. it could be one or the other. Like they find the venue and the venue has an amazing preferred vendor list and I'm on it or a planner's on it and they connect them with that. But also have multiple people in each category with multiple personalities and design styles because you have to, you're a matchmaker. Mm -hmm. Venues are matchmakers. And that's all that preferred vendor list is. The ones that are, the, the venues that are very successful and are constantly referred to the ones they say, oh, Susie Q is going to go really well with Irene. Mm -hmm. I know Irene is going to get them straight. Or they look like they're going to be a little high maintenance out of these three planners who can handle the mother of the bride. Totally. <laughs> a little I mean, bit more than both. Yeah. And I get phone calls from the venue is like, listen, Susie and Johnny are going to be calling you. Let me tell you about mom. Yeah. Mom is and you're like, okay. And you know, I'm taking notes. So it's kind of like, it's connecting and being a matchmaker. It's huge as, especially if you're building your venue from the ground up, take your time. Also, again, all information is not good information. Use, use your intuition. Cause most people who own venues are over a particular age. They're not like 22 years old opening up a venue. Totally. Like take all those years of, of working, all those years of living in life and apply them to making the best decisions for yourself as a business owner, but also for your future clients. Totally. I love that you said that about the age. Cause I think that the, the person who's in the place of life to be able to put up a couple hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And who's able to do this has a certain set of goals for their money. Mm -hmm. And, and actually, Irene, I think it's really insightful what you said uh, about connecting with your couples specifically for more corporate venues, because certainly, you know, a corporation or an investment group, you know, maybe they buy a building, maybe they hire a team to do it, but if they bring someone in who's just very robotic and is selling it in this corporate way of like, here's this space, this space, this space, this is what you do here. Okay, great. Do you want it or not? That's right. not going to have that same level, you're not going to be able to get the same type of clientele where you're asking your team, Hey, I need you to re represent me very well, right. you know? And, and so for anyone who's either in corporate sales or a venue management sort of company or anything like that, or part of a corporation who has this really taking time to understand the humanity of it and understand that this is not transactional, even yeah. though for our couples, I'm sorry, for our vendors who are owning these venues, it is, they're putting up tons of money. It's, it's probably <laughs> one of the, I don't want to say least creative, but like most involved money, yeah. money wise. Oh, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. They're putting a lot of money up front where a majority of us who, you know, like zero what, entry bearer or whatever they say, like where yeah. it's like, you don't have to have, like my kids asked me the other day, the conversations I have with these preteens, <laughs> uh, how much money did I have? How much money that invests to start my company and I was like 200 bucks They're yeah like I'm like I just needed a license and uh, get the little the, the URL and <laughs> I was like I'm a planner I was like a clipboard a couple hundred dollars <laughs> and my knowledge yep. you know photographers yeah you have equipment and things like that and you know, there's certain ones but for um for venue owners a lot of time is is it's a family investment mm -hmm. it's very personal it's um, their legacy. So it's yeah. something that they plan on passing on to their children and grandchildren. I mean, there's so many things, but I would say that, out of, you know, them, there are very few of us that put up that much money up front. It's totally. literally a dream. It's a wing and a prayer and a dream. Like it's- Before yeah. any money flows in at all. Right. A lot of times the service folks, we are taking the money before the service has been rendered. Right. A deposit or whatever to secure mm -hmm. our services for the day, which totally makes sense. But yeah, you're right. A venue, they've got to go in and they've got to put in hundreds of thousands of dollars before even they're able to one contract. do a tour. Absolutely. Right. Before one contract. And it's a lot of work and um, 
But I also think to have a humble heart and be like, you know what, I don't know it all. I might know the business side of things. I might have the finances to do it, but saying, okay, in order for this to be successful, what do I need also? And I think there, I think more than anything, that was one sector of the wedding industry and event industry that was lacking a community. Mm -hmm. If I was saying for the longest time, like a community for just venue owners and venue managers and coordinators. And I, and I think it's starting to happen now. There's groups out there. It's, you have a podcast and it's great because I think that's a whole, that's a special club. You know what I'm saying? Because not everybody understands it unless you've worked on the back of the house or work with a client. Like I understand liquor permitting. I understand, um, you know, when they, Uncle Sam and um, the fire chief come in and they measure and everything and the fire distinguisher, like it's just all these things or you think you're doing it right and somebody comes in like, no, that person was fired yesterday because they told you, they, they've been telling people the wrong thing and now you have to start over for your permitting. Mm -hmm. Like it's, you know, and how every city or every county in the state is different. Like there's so many little nuances that goes with owning a venue, like you said, without even taking in one client. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's flip it before, mm -hmm. before we wrap up today, let's talk to our planner friends mm -hmm. who are approaching some of these venues. Cause obviously we've just talked about some of the differences that venue owners have between anyone else in the industry. Um, as a planner, if you're looking to be on a list or you're looking to develop some relationships with venues, because you know, you said you had some great years, like the maybe third and fourth year where you started being referred more, you had a venue partner. Now things really started picking up. If a planner is out there looking for those sort of partnerships, what things do you feel like they could do to add value for the venue to maybe get on their list or maybe start getting some of those referrals that, that they're looking for? I would first say this, do not approach a venue or any other vendor out there asking them to be on their list automatically. Like, let's get to know each other, especially after this last year we've <laughs> been a part of, right? Let's get to know each other. Let's get to know what the pain points are. Let's get to know how we could help each other. And I always approach networking that way and site visits that way is getting to know, you know, getting to know the venue, getting to know the sales managers, doing a tour. I'm big on gifting. I mean, something I learned from one of my directors of sales is like, you don't, you know, it's kind of like when you go to someone's dinner party, you don't come empty hands it, you come with something. Yep. Um, and then there's times where I'm like a couple times a year, I literally take a half a dozen cupcakes to a sales office and I'll just literally, I'm like, I'm not here to chitty chat. I know you're busy. Here's some <laughs> cupcakes. Here's some wine. Eat the cupcakes. <laughs> you know, um, I had did that, you know, especially if we've had like not a difficult client, but just a, a really crazy wedding after the wedding, I go, you know, we did that to one of the director of sales here. We found out his favorite kind of whiskey. We bought him a bottle of his wh favorite whiskey with two beautiful rock glasses and we dropped it off. All right. And he was like, how do you know? We like, we called, we have our ways. We called his assistant and she giggled and was like such and such. And then we also send cupcakes to the rest of the ladies in the office. So getting to know people and getting to know what they want. And the best way that's worked for us to get on a list has been organic. Like we either mm. A, had a wedding coming up in that venue and we worked our tail off like we normally do. And then we've been asked to be a part of the list. And we've been had times where after a wedding, we get it put on the list and we don't even know. And all of a sudden the phone's ringing. Oh, I'm getting married such and such. I'm getting married such and such. And you're like, oh, sure. we're on the list? <laughs> That's cool. You That's know? gotta be an amazing feeling. But right, but if there's a place that you really want to go um part of, um, and I've done this before and I've heard a couple other planners give this advice too, and I love it. And it's it's being and it's not basically it's not being too proud, right? Is to mm -hmm. say to a venue, I really want to work here and I want I really want to assist you with your couples. Give me your toughest bride that you're having or groom that you're having, like you're pulling your hair out and they don't have a planner and let me help them complimentary. And I'm doing it like you're gifting this to them from you, but to prove myself. Cool. And um, I've done that a couple of times and it's benefited. I've helped them with open houses. I've helped them with major style shoots. Um, I've connected them with the right people. Like, what do you need? Um, and, and it's, that's benefited me getting on a list, but oh, I think all, honestly, also the biggest thing that I teach my, you know, I had a whole course on it and I teach my, my coaching clients on it is it is our responsibility as planners to know it all. 
not do it all, but know it all. And to make all of our creative partners' lives a little easier, especially on wedding day. Mm -hmm. And calling them each up and seeing what they need and how much loading time they need and, and caring about their skill and their service and helping them out as much as you can, it goes a long way. Mm -hmm. Because we are in charge of the day, but they are executing their portion of the day as well. Totally. To use a sports analogy, you're the quarterback, you know, or you're the, the, the concert director in a, in right, a right, orchestra right. or whatever, like you have such an important role. And so understanding their role and taking the time to care about that. I know we've worked with planners who've done that and it feels really good because right. not only do you know that they're thinking about what you're doing, but they're going to give you the appropriate time to be a professional. Absolutely. And the thing about it is, Jonathan, that, you know, our couples will refer you. Like I have a quite a few couples that I've gotten three or four weddings from like one family, right? Because they refer, refer, refer. But that's very rare. Like that's very rare that I get that many referrals from one bride. But my vent my caterers, makeup artists, photographers, videographers, I get referrals from all over the place. You know, my regular hairstylist, like it's just like <laughs> you, you get it from everywhere because they're like, oh, we know you're gonna care. So as planners, we are, it's a, we're in a delicate position where we have to service our clients well, right? And love on them and protect them and take care of them. But we also have to do the same thing for our creative partners. Because mm -hmm. what happens is if you're not managing, if you're not planning, managing and executing well, believe me, you will have an empty calendar. Mm. Believe me, your clients will not refer you and the people you work with will not refer you and will talk ill of you, unfortunately, That's but it's true. true. Yep. <laughs> Yep. That's, that's gold. That's gold. Irene, thank you. I so appreciate you coming on the show, being willing to share your experience with us. Thank you. And I am, um, I'm really excited for people to check out what you do. Cause you have a whole thing with smaller weddings now, correct? Can you tell I us a little do. bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, like many people last year was crazy, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, March, April, you know, our couples, bless their hearts, they all were, had their moments of, of, of little meltdowns. And, you know, once I let them have all the feelings, I was like, okay, now let's look at things logistically. And, um, cause that's what I'm known for. Like, I will love you. I'm a mama bear. And yes, I hear you, but logistically let's figure out what's next. Mm -hmm. And, um, I would say quite a few of our couples made the decision to pivot and do something small. Mm -hmm. so you know that was conversation and so I started doing some research and you know the small weddings micro weddings intimate wedding, weddings mini moons what I mean there's so many names out there for it now it's not a new concept it's been around for quite a while um, but no one was really doing it in Atlanta and you know a micro wedding or intimate wedding is you know micro weddings a step above um, an elopement and so my couples were looking at me for answers. <laughs> and so we came up with that and we came up with answers for them. And so Small Weddings Atlanta, Micro Weddings Atlanta came up and basically our micro weddings are custom. And so we initially started doing, it was like a pop-up thing where there was like four or five people can get married in the same day at different time slots. And we tried that and it worked a couple of times and, but it didn't, it just didn't speak to people because they were like, well, can I customize it? So I was like, you know what? Everyone gets a customized micro wedding and there you go. And that's been really well. So we finished off 2020 with nine micro weddings wow. and seven to eight intimate weddings. And basically our intimate weddings has all the same elements of a wedding day. It's just less people in the room. Okay. So our weddings, our mini weddings, our intimate weddings still had full design and full decor and every last vendor you would think of photo, video, the design, catering. It just was 30 to 50 people in the room. Mm. Um, and, and the magazine did a two page article on us. Cause they were like, wow, we didn't realize that people were still having full blown weddings, just 30 people in the room. And I'm like, absolutely. And it still took as much time to, <laughs> to plan and manage and execute, you know, 30 to 40 people. So the trend is still here, Jonathan. So we, I mean, there's not a week that goes by that we don't get um, two or three inquiries for intimate weddings, um, more than the micro weddings, but because the micro weddings is basically two hour, 90 minutes to two hours. It's I do some photos, cake, toast, and then they're gone. Mm -hmm. Our intimate weddings are more popular where it's like, okay, I have 30 people, small wedding ceremony, dinner party type of situation, beautifully decorated. So we're cool. doing quite a few of those now and it's going well. I mean, we're 
but you know, we're in Georgia, so we're still, you know, doing things. And I was just grateful that we were able to, how I, reason I started it last year was I wanted to be able to keep my team and I, our joints moving mm-hmm. because if you're, for, for my friends who didn't work too much last year, they're feeling the weddings this year, but I wanted to do that. I wanted to help out our venues that are in the area. They were actually reopening last summer and our vendor partners, because I had a ton of vendor partners. I was like, well, if I could put a few dollars in your pockets now, then I know you'll be around to service our people next year. Totally. Um, and it just kind of paid off. And it just made me feel good to be able to do something at a time where people just were like lost. And mm-hmm. um, many of my couples are like, we just want to be married. We want to buy a house. We want to have a baby. We want to get the second degree. I, I just, I don't, I, I'm tired of being a fiance. <laughs> Totally, yeah, hundred <laughs> like, percent. Let's just get done, and it's like I do, and I'm done. Like, let's go, and and I love it because my couples, babies already, and some of them have bought houses and are planning big trips this year. So it's it's just nice to that we were able to give back and help, you know, our clients as well as our pros that we work with every day. I love that. I love that. Well, you've definitely made an impact in the industry in your local market, and. Yes. On this show, I really, I like I said, it. I appreciate you coming on. And so thank you for anyone listening to this right now. Obviously, if you're watching on YouTube, you can check out the links to everywhere Irene is uh, in the description below. But Irene, for anyone listening on you know podcasts or anything like that, where can they reach you? On Instagram, I am at itindale events or Irene Tyndale is where I'm at or IreneTyndale.com. You are everywhere, by the way. If you look up <laughs> Irene Tyndale, you will find one of her pages. You'll find the Small Weddings Atlanta. You'll find any of the any of the pages. So I'm um, really excited for folks to check you out. But thanks again Thank for coming you. on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you so much.